Hi. Whoa. Um, thanks for being here. It's it's exciting to be here as an artist. I don't usually get to present my work, um, you know, outside of the art world as much. So um, I'm gonna actually do a setup here so I can look at my notes. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, mainly a project called Material Speculation, which is still in progress, and um, very much also with focus on activism, 3D printing, um, digital archiving, and also the political condition of our time. Um, but before kind of like moving into the, this project, Material Speculation, which is also still in, in progress, um, I want to talk about um, a work that I did prior to this project called Dark matter, um, which hopefully will give some context, conceptual and um, I guess technical context about the way I'm thinking about these technologies. Hmm. I'm sorry, I think I need to move it using this. Yeah. So as an artist and art activist, I've always been really interested in thinking about technology in a critical, poetic, yes, and also feminine way. Um, and one of the things that I that I deal with in a lot of my work, which are you know experimental 3D animation, web art, net art, video art, etc., and then um, yeah, recently some 3D printing projects, um, is to kind of like also think about the emotional dimension of my work. Um, and one of the things that I think kind of does a really good job um, wrapping up or framing um, the body of work that I have been doing and then the work that I will be talking about um, today is this quote by Donna Haraway, um, which, as you can read it, it says, it matters which stories tell stories, which concepts think concepts, mathematically, visually, and narratively. It matters which figures figure figures, which systems systemize systems. And I will, as I go through my talk, I will kind of, hopefully this will help in understanding um, the way that I think about using technology in my work. So, this um, was a work that I started in, these are just images, I'm going to give a context about it, but um, a work that I started, um, a research that I started in 2012, um, which was focusing on uh, gathering a list of objects or things that are unwelcome or forbidden in Iran. So I'm, I'm originally from Iran, I moved to the United States in 2007. Um, and one of the things that I became really interested in was um, thinking about 3D printing. I remember like the first time that I, that uh, like kind of like saw like an object being 3D printed. Um, the, the first thought that came to my mind was like, so what what would happen if you could 3D print something that is forbidden? Um, like let's say in a country like like Iran. Um, so I started like gathering a list of things that are forbidden or unwelcome. So from you know dogs that are considered um, unwelcome because they're they're considered dirty in in Islam. So if you're walking your dog, you can get a fine or a ticket. To satellite dishes to Barbie and, and Simpsons who that are like considered you know Western influences so um, you're not really allowed to have them or watch them although I grew up in Iran having access to basically all of this but it's always like a battle back and forth between you know the government and the people you know like my mom had the satellite dish taken down from her house like four times in the last like two years and she just goes and buy a new one um, so it's really interesting to think about our relationship to things that are forbidden and un unwelcome um, so I, I wanted to use 3D printing technology as a way to archive this aspect of, of, of you know, the life that I lived in Iran, the life that my relatives and family are living in Iran. Um, and But also I was kind of interested in stepping back and thinking about how ridiculous it is that these things are forbidden in, you know, like in the last 30 years in the time that we're living. Um, so then I did this series of work, which was a combination of these, these objects, but also to create this, like, I guess, humorous juxtaposition between them. So the first one is a dog wearing a deal with satellite dish. Um, the second one is a, you know, Simpson uh, with uh, Buddha. And then 
you know, a bunch of other ones like Barbie, VHS. Again, like all of these things being things that are, you know, for, forbidden. But I was really interested in thinking about how through archiving these series, right? So these are not practical. Like everyone has been talking about a lot of things that are practical. I get it. It's not practical. But uh, it, it like allows you to enter this historical dimension of a life that you live, right? And that's what art should be doing. Art should be discussing. Art, art should be like creating conversation around the life we live. Um, but I was really interested also in this like, yeah, like poetic ways of thinking about 3D printing. Like how you're using this tool, how you're using this technology to document aspect of uh, a life. Um, and then I kind of like, uh, I passed through that one. Uh, so this is like a, you know, again, pig, ham, being forbidden, and a gun. Um, and then I extended it to like other countries. I did research and like found like what, like, so this is like China, Saudi Arabia, North uh, Korea, and, and Iran. Um, and this piece actually is in outer space right now because there was a project that was uh, selecting this group of artists and sending their pieces to outer space, working with NASA, so it's really also interesting to think about that, right? Like this archive that I've created now has passed through this, all these like rules and laws where it's forbidden and now it exists somewhere that none of these laws actually exist, right? Um, so at the same time, when I, when I finished this body of work, um, I was doing a lot of research. Um, this is like the time that I started uh, an artist residency at Autodesk. So I was doing a lot of research uh, thinking about this like relationship between techno-capitalism, jihad, oil, plastic, desertification. And I was really inspired by this book, which if you don't know it, you should read it. It's amazing. It's called uh, Cyclopedia um, Complexity with Anonymous Material by Reza Negarstani, who is an Iranian philosopher. And this is actually the first um, sci-fi horror um, book I've ever, ever written about the Middle East. Um, but it's very complicated. It, it talks about, again, like all these like relationships between like these concepts. And um, what I found interesting was like how there's this like cycle. Like if you think about 3D, 3D printing, also archiving, is that like how the one of the most common material with 3D printers are like PLA or ABS plastic, right? And then how that comes from uh, like the material for it, the raw material is crude oil, and then how we use this, and then how you can create this cycle of like right like between techno capitalism, but also thinking about this body of work. I was like trying to come up with this body of work which would involve um, ideas around uh, jihad and, and terror, etc. Um, so at the, around this time when I was doing this research, um, this uh, I was also you know like oil was something that I was like thinking about um, again as a concept that goes just beyond what what we think about, right? But also uh, the f the very fact that oil is one of the you know most important. Obviously, everyone knows this uh, like income for the West, but also for like an Islamist group like ISIS, it's number one income, right? It has been the most important income, like, or like the funding. Uh, and like, I don't know if you remember this, or I think like maybe almost like two years ago, United States was like thinking about bombing some of the pipelines in, in Syria as a way to kind of like cut or block um, ISIS access to oil um, because it was, you know, uh, funding them basically. Um, and Negar Stani in, in that book talks about uh, like one of the things that he talks about that I was inspired by is that um, introduction he introduces basically jihad as the poll against which techno capitalism rages, where he draws occupying forces into urban environments, resulting in cities being torn apart, reduced to dust. So rather than wishing the war machines of the U.S. military to leave the Middle East, he talks about the fact that extreme Islamists. Um, um, the guide principle, uh, the guide, the most important principle is to keep the U.S. war machines ever destroying idols, returning everything back to desert, which is the concept of desertification, as, as he talks about it. So the war on terror um, then is the opposite side of the same coin of um, objective politics, and he, he says that jihad actually needs this war on terror and these war machines. Um, so this is me sitting in a crazy space. In Autodesk with like millions of machines and access to them, but just reading books um, and not like really using the machines because I was like really looking for a project that meant something for me when I was doing this like artist residency. 
And at that exact time, this is in February, when the video of ISIS destroying the artifacts came out um, and kind of like went viral, so everyone was talking about it. And at that moment, it kind of like felt like a really right time to, to respond to it as an artist. And again, like uh, the Dark Matter project being like a project that I was like thinking about all these like uh, ways that you, you can think about uh, archiving. But obviously that was more in a poetic, not practical way. But there was like a moment that just like, I was like, I remember just like talking to a friend and I was like, you know, I should just like 3D print these like artifacts. Like I have access to all this technology and that makes so much sense. Um, and so I started this project. I started like doing a lot of research. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But the more research I did about like Hatra, about, um, you know, Musul Museum, about Assyrian times. So obviously like me being from Iran, I've, I've studied like a lot of this in school because this is like a shared history, right, between Iran and, and Iraq. It was all ancient Iran. Um, but the more research I was doing about this, this uh, the artifacts, you know, which one was original, which one was like duplicate the less information I was finding and that was pretty amazing like I was like buying books trying to like uh, just like find information online and then I was not getting anywhere like I was doing research in Persian and Arabic and English and uh, it was amazing to see the lack of information out there so I started contacting many different people just from like archaeologists friends in Iran um, to you know historians that I knew in the US um, to you know like a couple of people that other people put me in touch to to British Museum who never replied to my email, but that's fine. But um, it's so it was that research became like a really big aspect of, of my project. And um, I remember like as time was like passing by, so I was like in the sec third or fourth uh, week of like research about this stuff. Then more information suddenly was like coming out. Um, so in the middle of my my research, I came to this this um, blog, which you might some of you might know about, but it's done by a PhD student at Columbia University, Christopher Jones, and he goes one by one through the video, like frame by frame, and explains uh, like each piece, or like tries to give as inf um, the name of the artifacts that were destroyed, or just like share information about them as much as possible. So this kind of like saved my life at that point, because I finally got to at least gather information about, yeah, like if I was going to choose 10 artifacts from everything that was destroyed, which one was original, which one was duplicate, which one was historically important, and why I would I would choose that one specifically. Um, so this, in addition to like everyone who who helped, kind of like really uh, helped shaping the project and what I wanted to do. Um, and then also another thing that I found interesting was for me as an artist, trying to connect with these artifacts again in a way that was emotionally and personally important to me. So I wanted to choose artifacts that kind of like meant something or symbolically could, could mean something when 3D printing them. So this is King Uthal and then unknown King of Hatra. Um, but I, I really like loved, for example, with King Uthal, you know, he has like this gesture of like hello or goodbye. Um, and then the unknown King of Hatra holding a stone and uh, um, a feather which is the symbol of knowledge um, so these were the first artifacts that I was going to work on and as I went through this process after like the research was kind of like starting to uh, you know make more sense I was going to use this process that like some of you already talked about using images as a way to 3d model these artifacts right so I was at Autodesk I had access to one to 3d catch the whole team of engineers are there um, um, Memento is another software that they're developing. Um, but then as I started meeting with them, I realized that actually it's not possible to use a method like this to, to model the artifacts because exactly of what I was just talking about, the lack of information. To use software like Memento or 1 to 3D Catch, you need at least 25 to 30 images from different directions. It needs to be certain quality. And that is just not available with these artifacts. Um, and I kind of realized that at, I think after like a month and a half of like doing research and working with them. So then I was like, that's fine. We're going to move to a second plan, which was um, modeling everything from scratch. So uh, using, you know, software like Maya, ZBrush, um, Mudbox, um, and then, yeah, just like gathering as, as the, you know, five, six images that I had, and then just using that as a point to, to model everything. And uh, so this is like, you know, the first one being um, 3D printed. And 
And then um, these, as, as you will see in the next images, I, because the research aspect of this project was so important, or also the lack of information, like all the time I had to put in to gather this information, um, I decided that I wanted to go further than just 3D printing this, these artifacts or like 3D modeling them. So inside the artifacts, as um, you can see there, I don't know if you can see well, but um, I've sealed a memory card and flash drives where it contains all the information that I've gathered from PDF files to images to um, maps to all the emails I've sent back and forth um, and also the video of ISIS destroying the artifacts and then SDL and OBJ files. Um, but I, I'm really interested in, in a way to think about these artifacts also as time capsules. It's so like if, if in 25, 30 years, um, kind of like for mostly for the future civilizations also, right, so to have access to this information. Um, and again, it's, it's, since it's an art project, it has like all these concepts, all these ways that you can think about uh, how you're using a current technology to, to uh, present something or like talk about something that, you know, might be lost in 30 years. Um, and the way I've sealed them, I always get this question, so I'm just going to say it right now. The way I've sealed them, you don't have to destroy it to get to the files. Um, you, so there's like a kind of like a plug. So as you, you, you saw in one of the images that um, when I was modeling them, we put, we put like a, kind of like holes, right? Like with this software, like just created a hole the size of the memory cards and flash drives. And then when the 3D printing was done and like I watched it, then we put the stuff, you know, the memory card inside and then use again resin to seal it back with glue, but you can use a sharp object to open it without having to destroy it. That, you can't really see the flash uh, drive as well, but here it's more clear. And these are some of the information inside. But as this project is kind of developing and, and continuing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just add more information and gather more information. So hopefully the very final piece is, is the most complete one with the most information inside of it. And then one of the things that also is an important aspect of this project to me is to find a way to give access to current civilizations, to public, to, to the project, to the files that I'm developing, to the 3D printable files, and then to the information that I've been gathering. Um, so in the, f in the next coming month, as I'm like moving through like working on the second um, series of this project, I will be releasing like all the online files that I've uh, modeled and also like all the information. Um, which I think, again, like as, as a concept, it's really interesting to think about. Every time each person will 3D print one of these artifacts, it kind of just give back power, right? That like ISIS has been trying to basically take away, or this like history that ISIS has been to, trying to remove. So, so much of this project is about remembering this history, is about using these tools as a way to resist it. And um, I think just, just having access, like everyone having access to these files, and again, the more it's 3D printed, hopefully the more it's, it's remembered. Numbered. And then these are the, some of the new series that I'm working on. Actually, Layla has been a really great advisor in uh, trying to you know, help me with like, these new series. Uh, but I'm going to, for the second series, I'm going to actually focus only on female bodies and female sculptures that were destroyed because conceptually, again, there's so much in there to think about. And um, I think it will make a really interesting collection. Um, and then this is, you're the first crowd to see this, but um, this is kind of like still in, in process. We're still working on this one um, but um, I think in the next three four weeks I will have hopefully at least two of them two of these um, artifacts done and at the very end we have been in the last almost one and a half day um, we've been all of us have been talking about all these ways to save the cultural heritage and um, the crisis we're in and our responsibilities um, and one thing that I've been thinking about since this this project that I've done material speculation has been receiving like a lot of attention a lot of press excitement around it, it it's great but at the same time um, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is like our relationship as like current historians as current activists artists to everything that we're doing to save the cultural heritage and but the fact that um, 
we are all like really excited about this technology. But I think it's really important to step back and think about how we are getting involved and why and what does it mean to you know go and 3D scan something and then bring it back and who owns it and how the whole like public access I think is a really great way to kind of like deal with this kind of issues. Um, I truly think it's uh, you know the, the technology and tools are like really important, really great. They're allowing us to save these this cultural heritage that can be lost. But at the same time, if, if we can't go beyond fetishizing the technology, then we're just stuck in the same issues that you know we've been we've been dealing with for many many years. So I just want to urge you. I want to encourage all of you to to think about this, to think about your actions, how it's influencing the world around you, and what does that mean in 30 years? Thank you. Thank you.